You are listening to WHOA Podcast, coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. My name is Colin Austin, and I am the host of this baby, and my guest co-host today is Michael Dees, the COE, the chief of everything at New Scooters for Less. What is up, man? What's up, man? You brought me back for like number four. I know, dude, you are like highly demanded. <laughs> Michael Dees is awesome. Keep bringing him in Ty's as the guest is getting co-host. warmer and warmer every time I sit here. I don't dude, know. Ty, I, like I checked in with him last week. Now he's in LA. He's traveling. Ty's all over the place. And he's like, he told me, I'm like, I'm like, hey, when are you gonna be back? He's like, he's like, dude, I'm trying to get back by the end of April, but I might be going back to pack or going to Pakistan to play golf. And so, I hope that means he's doing well. Yeah, he's Ty's doing all right. And you guys, if you guys want to check him out, make sure you follow him on Instagram at Ty Recurian. And um, and yeah, just give him some love. Tell him that we miss him. So, (laughs) but but you've been doing a fantastic job as the guest co-host. I appreciate that. I'm happy to be here. It's always uh, it's always fun. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna have to tell what's going on in the scooter world anything exciting right now so right now it's like the semester's winding down the students are getting ready to graduate and it's like about to be storage time so everything right now for us is prepping for storage yeah, a lot of people don't know that we run a scooter hotel that's exactly summer. what it is it's a scooter hotel it's a scooter hotel last year we had how many like close it was to, yeah it was close to 300 for, for the summer 300 scooters in our scooter hotel you know anybody needs to store their scooter? Let them. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll do it. So, well, you guys, I am super, super excited. We were just talking about how intimidated we were that John Spence is in here. You guys, Man. John Spence is the greatest speaker in the <laughs> world. And he's right here in our studio. John, thanks for being here, man. It's my pleasure, it's my pleasure, of course. <laughs> uh, he was like, man, it is super early. And I'm like, yeah, we tried to do that because of the boxing gym next door. And of course they were like beatboxing at 7.45 this morning, or like doing their just beat. Speed bags. Yeah, just uh, doing their thing next door. So, um, but luckily, like hopefully they'll keep the volume down just enough. <laughs> We can but, talk uh, over them. Yeah, yeah, we can, for sure. I'm, 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 I'm not worried about it. This is bootstrap entrepreneur <laughs> podcast life right here. <laughs> so, um, no, but John, you guys, just so you guys know who John is, if you don't know who John is, one, yes, he's an incredible, incredible speaker. You're talking like, the, known as like one of the top 100 business thought leaders and one of the top 500 leadership development experts in the world. Not Gainesville, not... <laughs> Florida, not the United States, but the world, and is an international keynote speaker, author. How many books do you have? Five. Five books. Um, Awesomely Simple. Yeah, Yeah, that's the main one. I always want to say Simply Awesome. (laughs) I'll take that. that (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But Awesomely Simple, and um, I got an autographed copy of that book. I feel special. special. You are special. I I actually, I got that from um, Kristen Hadid's of it. Yeah, I saw her book over on your shelf right over there. So, um, but I am, I'm just thrilled that you're here. I, it, it's interesting because last night I, do, I did get some questions from some Gainesville entrepreneurs. Oh really, great. Yeah, so great. I, ha- I have those that I wanna make sure that I get to. Um, and it's, it's great because I, I feel like a lot of the Gainesville business community knows you and has heard, I mean, a lot of us have heard you speak. Like I love, anytime that I know that John's speaking somewhere in town, I'm like, oh, like I'm there, like how can I get there? Thank you, thank um, you. And, but it's interesting because I'm like, okay, a lot of people might not know like your story. And so I want to dive into that sure. just a little bit. But before we do, I know that's like the suspense of <laughs> But before we do, I want to get, I want to let everybody know we are coming down to the end of this rap spot sponsor, sponsorship that we have that the, we are giving away a vehicle rap. You know Garrett Crocker? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And he is, a, they, the team over at Rap Spot ha, is giving us a $2,500 vehicle wrap to give to a local business here. And all you guys have to do, like, we're going to, the last day to sign up is May 13th. Today is May 6th, and you have to go to whoagnv.com, click giveaway, and register to win. You guys, you guys are running out of time. This is it, this is the home stretch, so make sure you go sign up to win. And again, I told, there's a thing on there that says if you go follow follow the podcast and do, do six or seven different things, I'm gonna give you a shout out on the podcast, and guess what? I've got those right here. I got four people, I got 
Frankie Schiolino, I hope I said that right, um, from Dry, Florida, Mandy Connors, Miss Mandy's Marvels, Andrew Burkett from Athras awesome. Games, Athras Entertainment, and I know that this guy's playing a joke on me, Charles King, the keg of laughs comedy showcase. <laughs> <laughs> Chaz, you're awesome, man. So thank you for that. And uh, you guys... Those are those are my shout outs. I appreciate you guys following us and supporting us. And it's been it's been awesome. I was just telling John, this is episode fifty two. This Made is episode it. we a have year. we have done it a year. Where's my phone? Can you hear me? Did I lose my phone? Can you hand it to me, please? Sorry, I'm getting really hot and the only way I can control the AC is through my, through my phone. <laughs> um, but we have but a year. Guys, I cannot believe it's been a year already. And it's just been so incredible to see Gainesville support this and just build us up and share it and you guys i just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart all you guys know how much time and effort that not only i but the my crew in here is putting into this to really make this a a special podcast and just to see the community embrace it means a lot to me and so i just wanted to say thank you episode 52 a year in congratulations a year thanks man it's it's awesome so john and this is, I mean, you guys, this is somebody who is a huge community supporter. So, and has always been there anytime I've had a question, I've emailed him several times saying, hey, yes, like have. I've, I have this kind of going on. What would you do in this case? And and so thank you for that. Like you've always been somebody who's been very invested into the younger guys, the companies here, the startups, the community, like, and and I just appreciate that your investment. I know that, you know, I just saw him speak at the United Way yeah, that was great. Event. That was awesome. That was, that was, a was lot an of fun. awesome event. And you guys, real quick, I mean, just to give a little bit of love to United Way, I mean, th- they do the small business partnership, and it, like we pay like hundred dollars a month, but they do a really, really good job. Yes, the money is going to really important causes and a lot of organizations, nonprofits that need it, but they also do a really fantastic job of just like putting on valuable events, um, and then these guys go in and dedicate some of their time to like to be there and speak at these things. And it's just awesome. And they did like a little business yeah, summit. Yeah, it's the third time I've done that. Yeah. So it's, it's always a lot of fun. They get a real good crowd, a lot of business people from town. And I, as you said, they help a, a, several really great charities. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you carving out some of your time to speak at that thing, because it's it, it's awesome and I always look forward to it. So, But I am so excited to dive into your story a little bit. I really want you to take us back to to how you even got to the point where you became one of these top speakers in the world. Um, and and you went to the University of Florida. Yes, I did. So like- I had a long route to get there, but yes, I did. <laughs> so maybe take us, I don't, yeah, I mean, I would love to hear some of that route if you had those entrepreneurial tendencies as a young man and like, and then just, just your story. Cool, cool. Uh, I was born in Miami, Florida. I'm a fifth generation Floridian, which is pretty rare. Uh, grew up, went to a great prep school down there. My father was a very famous attorney. I don't know, you're too old, but have you ever seen the show Matlock? That, I yeah, love Matlock. That, would, my, that was based partially on my dad's life. So uh, he out. was the seersucker suit, Southern <laughs> lawyer, but he was a, a malpractice attorney and very, very famous. So went to prep school, uh, graduated, and I got accepted to a bunch of colleges, but I chose the University of Miami because it was close to my girlfriend and my boat, which is not exactly why you should pick your college, (laughs) which is why I failed out a semester and a half later with a 1.6 GPA. Uh, Problem, my father was one of the top alumni ever to, to attend. He's won all kinds of awards. The year I got kicked out, he was on the board of directors, and there was a building named after my dad. So let's just say um, the family wasn't happy. No, no pressure there. Or <clears throat> no, I, actually, I was pretty much disowned uh, and sent on my way. And my way was up here. And I came up and applied at the University of Florida. I'll never forget over at, uh, at uh, the registrar's office right, up, right around the corner, 13th and University. And uh, they laughed at me. They just literally, the, when I handed the woman my transcript, she goes, we don't take people like you. And I went, wow, that's great. So I went on to Santa Fe where uh, this would have been 84, which is before everyone in this room was born. Uh, And Santa Fe is one of the top colleges in the country now. Back then, not quite so much. So I got in and uh, while I was there, I met a great professor who turned my life around. Got named Roger Strickland, still a professor over at Santa Fe. That's awesome. Oh yeah, we're still close friends. Uh, I would consider him my second father. And uh, he, he taught me three things it takes to do well in college. He said, if you want to get straight A's in college, it's only three things. Number one, read the books. And up to then, I hadn't been. 
So that helped a lot. He said, number two, ask for help, and number three, start study groups. So I would uh, stand up at the beginning of every semester, put my hand up, and say, hey, I'm John, I'm gonna have a study group, uh, come to my house Tuesday and Thursday night, we'll study from seven to 10, then we'll go out and get a beer later, because back then the drinking age was much lower. And uh, started out with, oh, and then I would say, as long as you have a 3.6 GPA or higher, otherwise you can't be in the study group. And uh, I ended up graduating from uh, Santa Fe, I went to U of F, same thing there. And I uh, ended up graduating from uh, U of F uh, in the top three in the country in my major, was hired by the Rockefeller Foundation, and four years later I was the CEO of an international Rockefeller Foundation. It sounds so easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, oh, that's like yeah. a piece of cake. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. you gotta do the big failure thing. I mean, I still remember sitting, literally, it's four blocks from here, three blocks, on the corner of 13th University after I failed out and they wouldn't let me into University of Florida, crying sitting on that corner and crying and thinking to myself, I have to turn this around. I you know, I had dreams of, I, I was fairly entrepreneurial when I was young, uh, but at that time, when I was in college, I started my own public relations firm, advertising firm, which you'll love this. Back then was when they had just started doing desktop publishing. And I would go around to all the bars in town and say, I'll do your coming attractions, you know, your specials, I'll lay all that stuff out. I don't want any money, I just want to trade out for, for for a bar tap. So I'd do the work, I'd get a $100 bar tap. Well, back then when we had quarter beer, <laughs> I was a god. <laughs> like, beer for everybody in the whole damn place. You, know? you get was, beer, you get beer, everybody gets beer. <laughs> oh no, I walk in and like, all my friends, I, I'm buying beers for everybody for the whole night. It's hard to go through a $300 awesome. worth of uh, credit at a quarter a piece. So we had a lot of fun. And uh, I ended up get, uh, selling that to another student before I left. And I taught karate here. I was uh, on the rugby team. Uh, I was the dean's teaching assistant. So I kept myself pretty busy. I had to put myself partially through school. Mm -hmm. My mom helped me out a lot, but. Uh, I mean, was that like moment on the corner? Like, is that one of those light bulb, like defining yeah. moments? Oh no, that was that, like, that that's was, the moment. There, that was the moment that I decided I, no one else got me into this. I caused it myself. Uh, my mom couldn't fix it. My dad did at that point didn't want to have anything to do with me. So he wasn't going to fix it. So I realized I was the only one that could fix it. And that's when I, I went on the tear to start learning. I mean, I, I got every tape I could get, every book, everything on how to be successful, how to have a good life. Uh, fast forward, I still read about 100 to 120 books a year. Yeah, I knew but, that about you. Yeah. And I was about to ask about, like, I was ask, gonna ask that exact question was how much are you reading? I still now, read, I read over 100 books a year, yeah. But I, I've tuned, toned down on the books partially because I'm reading a lot more blogs and I spend an hour every single morning during breakfast and read Fortune Forbes, Inc., Entrepreneur, like every business magazine, I've got it on, a, on my iPad thing called Flipboard. And I'm totally caught up on every one of those magazines, Harvard Business Review. So I'm just reading the new article that came out that day. Yeah, I just feel special because I follow you on LinkedIn, and then when you share those articles on LinkedIn, I'm like, okay, I'm reading what John's reading. This is a good. This is a good direction. <laughs> I got well. I don't. I'll tell you about this. I got a really cool new thing. Is I get up when I do that, and I load it into my Twitter feed, and then we have a. I have a newsletter that goes out every two weeks. But the cool thing about that is it's run by AI, and it it pulls the stuff off my Twitter. And then if somebody gets the newsletter and reads it, it looks to see how what articles you open and how long you read them, then the artificial intelligence begins to customize your newsletter just for you. That's so awesome. everybody gets a completely different newsletter. That's I, I probably post 40, 50 articles a week on Twitter and it pulls just the top six that would be, you know, my ideal for you. For you. Yeah, that's it's so cool. cool. Yeah, it's really cool. How does somebody sign up for that? They just go to your website? You just go to my website and sign up for the blog and you automatically get it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, I, I get more compliments of that. And then I started doing a business in a minute videos. And those have been really cool too, because people have a short attention span. Are you sharing, where are you sharing that? Is that mainly? Yeah, it's, uh, that one is also through my newsletter and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I've got a, a Vimeo channel that it's on. Awesome. Yeah. Um, the, I, I want to go back to like sure. the defining moment. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing you did, like, was just start educate like going out and reading more like what was the first book that do you even remember like the first book that you bought or like I, the, I remember the first step the first action that you took the first action I took and I, this is a long time ago was, was Zig Ziglar and a guy named Jim Rohn were two really really famous motivational speakers and I bought uh, all of Zig's books and I got all the tapes and I've just listened to them over and over and over again uh, then it start picking up other other, other uh, motivational books and life books. I've read, you know, probably at this point, well over a thousand. 
Uh, and then it was uh, Professor Strickland, Roger Strickland, that taught me to read the books for classes. And I would go and get the book, and then I'd ask the teacher, are there any other books I can read in addition to the textbook? And I'd read two or three books per class. And I, you know, like the classes I was struggling in, I'd go to the, the session before my class and the session afterwards. So I'd take it three, three times a day to try to make sure that I could understand what was going on. I struggled a lot in the business classes. Really? Yeah, I don't have good math skills, so it was brutally hard to get A's in accounting and, thing, and economics and things like that. I had, I had to take financial accounting twice. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I dropped it once, and then that was the one where I'd, I'd spend the whole day over there and sit through three or four classes, the same class three or four times, trying to figure out, <laughs> you know, trying to understand the stuff. Because at that point, I had really, really good grades, and I didn't want to ruin them. But they didn't have study edge back then? No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Anything like that back then? No, no nothing it was like, like that. like just your students? No, the only thing we groups. had was students that went through it the year before that would, you know, get, you could get their notes, yeah. literally. And I, I would save my notes and give them to people. They used to sell them to each other, but I would just give my notes from the semester away to somebody that was in the class after me. <laughs> That's so awesome. That's a lucky person. <laughs> yeah. The, um... The marketing stuff that you're doing, I mean, you, you weren't monetizing that with the, the bar tabs? Cause the, you said the bar you, tab was the monetization. That was the monetization, <laughs> but like, <laughs> did you end up selling that to anybody? Or, yeah, Because yeah. you said you sold it, but yeah. like for cash. I sold like, for 3,000 bucks. Yeah, is, that's... As a college student in 1983, would be the equivalent of probably 20,000 now, 25,000. That's awesome. And basically, it was just my accounts and my computer. I gave the person my, I had a Mac back then, one of those ones that sat, it was, you know, one of the box ones, yeah. and sat on top of a thing about this big, <laughs> which was like one meg of, you know, memory. Our young audience has no idea what yeah, you're I talking know, about. Yeah, I know, yeah. Well, it's back in dinosaur. I, I was actually the first class to go through University of Florida with computers. Yeah. Yeah, halfway through, I was, because I did public relations and marketing, we did everything typing. And... Uh, and then we moved to computers, and I, it's funny because I couldn't pass the typing test either. I can't do the touch typing, but I have a semi-photographic memory. Mm -hmm. So I went to the library and got all the different te typing tests they could give, and I memorized every single one of them you know, to the word. And they'd put one on the stand, and I'd look at it for two seconds and then just look down and type and get it. And one of the, you know, like this with yeah, right. four fingers. And a professor would look at me and go, how did you do that? And I said, I just looked, read it real quick and memorized it. No, you didn't. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. I just, uh, that's how fast I could do it. Okay, we're giving you another one then. Put it down, I go, okay, and just start typing. Like, how do you do that? I never, never ever told them that I had memorized it for a month before I got there. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I wonder if those types of classes, they even still have like, Ma Mavis, Beacon, classes? Mavis Beacon teaches typing was the one I remember the most. It was really? like the, the old school Mac, like floppy disk drive game. Yeah, I mean, That's it's just what my mom learned on. Right, but yeah, it's just fascinating. That, that would be my age. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> well, sorry about that. I, to be fair, I learned on it too. But oh, okay. well, it's fascinating to me because, like, my kids, they don't, you know, they don't need it. They can, I think, now with an iPad keyboard, they can just be like talking to you. Yeah, and this, and this, and me too. I mean, like, I never took a typing class that I can ever remember. Maybe like in elementary school, playing Oregon Trail or something. Not like I don't did that even involve like. <laughs> Type. I don't even know if it did, but I, you know, now it's just you've done it so much. It's just I, well, I don't type anymore. Yeah. I talk to my computer. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, my oh last my gosh. four books I've written, I've written by sitting down and talking to my computer. It's yeah. amazing how, thing, how technology, you know, I, I hear the things that you're talking about, listening to, you know, audible stuff yeah. on, on tape. Like the things haven't changed. It's just the, the how we consume it has changed. Yeah, well, I back mean, then it was tapes. Now it's just digital recording. It's funny because even I go to the University of Florida. I'll speak into uh, like a couple classes, and when I'm telling my story, I'm like, "Yeah, like I had trouble getting on a bus to go to school, which is why New Scooters for Less exists today." My solution was a VCR where I would record my classes on Cox Channel Five because they used to <laughs> they used to like air the business classes. On cable, I remember that. on cable TV, so yeah. I would just set my VCR. And I feel like I'm dating myself when I'm like telling the college kids, "Yeah, I used to set my VCR." <laughs> in the, you know, year 2000, 2001, 2002. Well, we had so. that back in my day. It was called "Send Somebody Else." <laughs> <laughs> it's in class. Like, uh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> I can just totally see that. <laughs> um, you gra you graduate. You work at Rockefeller. Yeah. You become the CEO four years later. You made that yeah. sound really, really easy, yeah, really simple. Easy. Like, I mean, like, how did you, yeah, what, were, what was the process? how did you get the job? I'll give, I'll give you an interesting you, thing. If you've got young listeners, they'll, yeah, they'll yeah. get a kick out of this. 
when I graduated, I backed up my junior year and I said, if I could get a job doing anything I really, really wanted to do, what would that be? And at that particular point in my, ta- my life, my favorite things was lay on the beach, drink rum drinks, go fishing and play golf. So I said, how can I get a job doing that? And I looked out and said, well, you know, I get a job working at Bacardi Rum as a public relations guy because I like Bacardi a lot <laughs> or uh, Club Med, you know, and go off to a Club Med or maybe work for a big boat company or resort. And then I found out that uh, the Rockefellers, uh, Mr. Winthrop P. Rockefeller, who was my boss, was a great outdoorsman and loved to fish. And he had his own foundation called the Billfish Foundation that uh, did marine research on billfish species, uh, marlin, sailfish, swordfish, things like that. And I thought, wow, this is cool. So I, um, when I graduated, I didn't send out any resumes. I wrote a 26-page proposal and sent it to the foundation. I've studied you, I've studied your market, I understand nonprofits, here's who you compete against, I've got all your advertising and marketing for the last three years, here's the things I think you're doing really well, here's the areas I think you can improve, and here's a list of 100 ideas I have that I would implement if you gave me the job. And uh, I got a call, I'll never forget this, I used to live right here on 7th in a house with five other guys. I slept under another guy's bed. We put his bed up on cement blocks in my, you know, oh, my mattress, and I would read by sticking the book in the box oh, spring wow. above me, and I had lights down. Oh, no, it was awesome. I loved it. Yeah. So uh, one of my friends picks up the phone and says, uh, yeah, right. And they're like, hang on a second. John, there's someone from the Rockefellers on the phone with, you know, for you. and they called and said, you've got an interview. And I went down to Miami, which uh, where Mr. Rockefeller owned a uh, boat yard, and had a private apartment there and went to meet him. And I walked in and he literally said, can I get you something to drink? I said, what are you drinking, sir? He said, I'm having a rum and coke. I'll have one too then. And uh, sat down with him, I'm 20, 20 something years old. And he said, I only have two questions for you, John. How much do you want to make and when do you want to start? So I, uh, by the way, and you guys, I'll date myself now. I looked at him, I said, I'd like $19,000 a year. And he said, <laughs> Okay, and I went, oh, shit, right in front of him. I hit down, like, damn, I didn't ask for enough. He laughed, he goes, you'll learn more, don't worry. But when I was graduating, the average salary for a public relations student was $12,000 a year, mm. so 12 to 13. So asking for 19 was, was just like a crazy lot. a lot. Uh, 30% more than anybody else. No problem. And I went to work and I, I started there writing speeches, writing articles, uh, writing for a bunch of magazines. And uh, then I became the CEO's right-hand man, about, literally about a year in. And everywhere he went, uh, it was a gentleman, another guy, I won't mention his name, but it wasn't Mr. Rockefeller, he was the chairman of the board. And uh, we had uh, four billionaires and everyone else was more, worth more than $100 million on my board. Uh, we had some of the wealthiest people in America on my board of directors. And we went away for a retreat at Mr. Rockefeller's mountain. He, uh, he, he's passed away since, but he owned his own mountain, Petagene Mountain. Had to take a helicopter to fly to the top, armed guards everywhere. Oh my yeah, yeah, I mean, he's got, se- not Secret Service, but he had uh, ex-SEALs uh, and stuff that worked for him. And uh, we're up there in the middle of a board meeting and my CEO has a nervous breakdown. The board is so brutal on him, asking him such hard questions that he just starts shaking and then crying and he gets up and walks out and, uh, Don Tyson of Tyson Chicken was our chairman at that time. Uh, he was on the Forbes 40 list of richest men in America. He turned to me and said, can you handle the meeting, son? I said, yes, sir. And I ran the rest of the meeting. And uh, the guy that I worked for, they sent him away for medical stuff for a couple of months and I ran the foundation. He never came back. They hired another guy and then they, you're gonna love this story. They said, we want you to get to know, and I'll just use his first name, David because you're gonna be his right-hand man. We're grooming you, but you're, I'm 25 at this point, way too young to be the CEO. But you know, 15 years, 10, 15 years, you'll make it. So they tell me to meet this guy, and we go to downtown Miami, and I go to meet him at the top of this building that's got one of those you know, big private clubs, Miami private club up there. And I, we open the elevator together, and he steps off, and they're like, I'll just use Smith. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Smith. So glad to see you back. And he's like, hey, how you doing? And we have your favorite table for you and your iced tea with two lemons is just the way you like it. And as we walk through, he's waving to everybody in the room and they're all waving back at him I'm like, damn, this guy knows everybody. It's cool. Then halfway through lunch, he looks at the waiter and says, excuse me, where's the bathroom? And I said, he's never been here before. How does everybody know him? They know his favorite table. They know his favorite drink. He knows everybody in the place but he's never been here before. I figured out later, he walked up early, gave the guy hundred bucks and said, when I come in, call me by my last name. I want a table like this. And then as he walked through the thing, he waved at everybody. And if you're in a restaurant, somebody waves at you, what do you do? You go, hey, who the hell's that, honey? (laughs) 
That's what he did. And I remember going back to Mr. Rockefeller and saying, there's something wrong here. I don't understand it. I'm not old enough to figure this out, but there's something wrong here. They hired him within six months. They fired, uh, you, you want more fun stories? Yeah. So I want everything that all these Gainesville business owners and entrepreneurs who like see you and li listen to you speak on a regular basis, I want them to really know John okay, Smith. I so, want them to hear the stuff that they're not going to hear anywhere else. Okay. Well, the, we'll give you a bunch and of And then, like, stories. I'm like, the hard part about that, if I interrupt you, I apologize. No, no. Because I'm like, my brain is like firing 100 questions <laughs> per second right now. And I'm like, cool. Well, we'll finish this story how I ascended to <laughs> Yeah, throne. I'm like fascinated. So we were down at a big charity event in the Virgin Islands. The, every year we do a, Mr. Rockefeller had a thing called the Boy Scout uh, tournament. It was a marlin fishing tournament. And uh, we had giant boats come in from all over the country, you know, 60, 70 foot yachts. And everybody paid, I think, 50,000 bucks to be there. And it was all donated to charity. And I was down there doing the public relations thing for our company. and. Uh, I come back one day from being out all day and I look at my phone in my hotel room and it's blinking and I pick it up and there's like 12 voicemails from the CEO, David. He's like, where the hell are you? Get in my room right now. Rah, 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 rah. I'm like, Whoa. So I go running over there. I just come off the golf course. I'm still wearing spikes and I got my, I'm covered in sweat. I got my, my golf glove in my back pocket and there's food trays stacked up outside of his room. I mean, he's been holed up in there apparently for like three days. I knock on the door. He opens up. He goes, where the hell have you been? So I've been playing golf. He goes, playing golf? You're fired. I said, okay. And I walked back and I packed up my stuff and I uh, got all cleaned up and I headed to the airport to, to catch a flight home. And on the way, I swung by the marina to Mr. Rockefeller's yacht. He had a big yacht there. And I knock on the door and his captain, Mike Lemon, comes back. He goes, can I help you? I said, I, I just need to talk to Wynn for a minute. And he said, okay. And Wynn comes out and I go, I just want to tell you, sir, it was an honor to work for you. Uh, I, I've been terminated. And he goes, why? I, I said, well, I was playing golf all day. He goes, David fired you for playing golf? And I go, yeah. And he goes, what's your title, John? I go, I'm director of public relations. He goes, what, who are you playing golf with? I said, that's a great question. Sports Illustrated, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I listed <laughs> all the top fishing. I said, I hosted everybody. And we had a big lunch when I had a beer. And we had a great time. He goes, isn't that what I pay you to do? I said, yes, sir. He goes, you're doing it really well. I said, well, thank you, sir. He goes, you're doing it so well. I'm you fly home, I'll have the jet brought around, you go home on the jet, and uh, when you get back, you're gonna be the new CEO, and your first job is to fire David. <laughs> so I'm, I get back, and a couple days later they show up, and I'm sitting in the boardroom, and the CEO, David, walks in, and Mr. Rockefeller's standing there, and Mr. Owen, who is his right-hand man, and he looks, David looks at me at the table and says, what's he doing here? And Wynn goes, uh, Mr. Spence has something to say to you, because he doesn't work here anymore. And he looks at Wynn, and Wynn goes, don't look at me, look at him. He goes, why? He goes, you work for him now. And I said, actually, not any longer. You don't work here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. This is, like, crazy. Isn't it cool? It was just the coolest How do we not – do you have a – is this in one of your books? No, no like, place. Why ha, like, why haven't you told no, this I, story? I this also, story is incredible. Oh, I also ran one of the largest Marlin tournaments in the world for seven years. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff I did in the past that nobody here really knows. You guys, welcome to the six-hour podcast with John Spence. Because, <laughs> like, this is going to be awesome. Isn't that a fun story, though? <laughs> I, I love when Mr. Rockefeller goes, what were you doing? Playing golf. Isn't that what I pay you to do? <laughs> you know, like, so like you're so 26 years old, though. Yeah, 26. I mean, so one, I want to go back a little bit where the other CEO broke down. Yeah. And you had to step in. Yeah. I mean, you're like, wh how are you feeling? Like, are you are you like nervous? Are you, you know, is this is this like one of those again another defining moment? And you yeah. just recognize it, and you're like, this is something that I'm going to do. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to rock this. Or were you scared shitless? Uh, a, a, not well. It really it's going to we be weird. I was the one that prepped the CEO for all the board of meetings. So okay. I did all the research. I did all the reading. I created all the reports. So you knew it. I, I had filing cabinets there. When they'd ask him a question, I'd go through the file and hand him the right piece of paper. So when he walked out, I actually knew it a lot better than he did. So this, I, I, I was nervous, but you don't have time to be nervous when a couple of billionaires go, you're in charge. Uh, but I had all the information. So every question they, they asked, I had the answer to, and I had it, I didn't even have to look at the paperwork. But were you already confident in speaking in front of oh, that was at that point? It was, I had spent enough time around uh, those folks that they, and I grew up in a wealthy family, so I was used to being around rich people, people not people like that. But uh, no, I mean, there were most of them, they wanted us to succeed. 
They wanted the company to succeed. The questions they were asking were good financial fiduciary questions that they should have been asking. They were intimidating, but if you had the answer, it's not intimidating. So I had all the answers. Um, when I did get scared shitless was when they put me in charge and I flew back and realized I had to run the company. And I had never run any company of any kind before. And I realized I was in way over my head. And I got very, very lucky. I, I mentioned his name, another turning point in my life. I had Roger Strickland here in Gainesville to turn my life around. Mr. Rockefeller had a guy named Charlie Owen, who is his, uh, basically his accountant, his lawyer, his st strategist. Because when I was working for Wynn, um, I think he owned 28 companies. And he used to bounce us around as CEOs, which was really fun. He'd take me and send me to Montana to run one of the companies he, he owned there, send me to run another one for a month. So that was a great education too. But Charlie would walk into my office. He had a son that was about my age that was in Cambridge studying overseas. And I think he missed his son a lot and sort of took me under his wing. Charlie would walk in my office every Monday, put a business book on my desk, or sometimes history or something, but 99% of the time business, say, I'll see you Friday for lunch. And on Friday, I would, we would go to M's Home Cooking, Chili Day, sit with a big bowl of chili with cornbread, and he would beat the shit out of me. What about this? What about that? What about this chapter? Explain this to me. What, what does this idea mean? And I would explain it to me. He said, all right, now, what are the three things you're going to apply out of that book? And I would tell him, he'd write them down and say, you'll now be held accountable for doing that in your job. Here's another book. So for six years, every day I got a book. Every Friday I had to make a book report. And on Monday, I was held accountable for actually applying the things I learned in the book. Then he'd, he'd do something really cool is he'd call me and say, meet me at the executive airport. Uh, we're going to negotiate a $300 million deal. You're going to sit in on it. And he would bring me there and say, don't say anything. Sit there and take notes. And I'd sit in the corner, furiously taking notes. And then he afterwards, he'd go to dinner. He goes, now debrief me. What happened in that session? What did we do well? What did we not do? What did the other side do? How did they make mistakes? And I'd have 30 pages of notes. We'd go page by page through the notes. He'd say, that's a good point. You're wrong here. Here's what actually happened. And I got to do uh, several of those. Well, is this uh, after you're already CEO? Or is this yeah. Before? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was. He took me under his wing and he pushed me really hard. And when I would, I would make, uh, I would call him for input and advice on big decisions. And every now and then he'd let me make one and blow it up. And I remember a couple of times I made decisions that I five, six, 10 times my salary uh, I'd lose. And I'd be like, oh, they're gonna fire me for sure. He'd come in, he just, no, that was the right decision. Just didn't go the way it should have. I'm fine with that. I'd be like, whoa, I thought I'd be in trouble. He goes, no, no, I'm really proud of you. You know, you took a risk, you made the, it was a good risk. It was well thought out. Just didn't go the way it was supposed to go. That's fine. Yeah, it was really cool. I was very late, and we're still friends too. He is, there is a mention to him in my book on leadership, and he didn't know it because I'd lost track of him, and I found out where he was, and I sent him a copy of the book. And he got into the first chapter and then called, and sent me an email and said, oh my God, I can't believe you put me in the book. So we're still in contact too, he and That's I. That's crazy. Yeah, it's cool. That's really, really cool. Dang. I'm like mind blown right now. All right. Do you have any questions? I mean, I don't even know where to start. There's so much, there's so much to unpack there, you know? Um, gosh. Just the. I, I can't even like wrap my head around some of that. Like, just the pressure. I feel like, like it's just immense uh, to be in that situation with these influential people. And obviously, I mean, it seems like you're really confident about it, but there's still a lot to answer to. Uh, uh, the confidence came from preparation, from doing my homework. Uh, and a, a lot of confidence came too from the things I was learning in books. I mean, one of the reasons they, they jumped me up there too is we'd have a board meeting and my CEO uh, wouldn't have any ideas. And they'd say, well, what about this? And I'd say, well, you know, I read this and I think this and this might be a good idea. And they go, you know, and Mr. Tyson would go, great idea, John, let's run with it. And it was suddenly my idea, even though it was something I'd read in a book. Uh, and I was extremely well prepared. I had an amazing staff. Uh, I was 26 at the time. Most of them were my age or younger. I had a couple of people in their 40s and 50s. But uh, we were the, we were virtual team, which is very rare in the early mid 80s. It was when laptops first started uh, being developed. And I got laptops for everybody and said, I don't care if you come in, I don't care where you work, when you work, what you do, as long as your work's on time and it's world class. I'm giving you 100% freedom. And it went great. I mean, the foundation grew, we doubled in size. It, it was amazing. We became the best in the world at what we did. And, uh, and then one of my board members found out that I had no office hours for my whole team. Just come and go as you please. I mean, he came in one day, it was me sitting there alone. It's like, where is everybody? I don't know. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, from now on, everybody must clock in. I go, Mr. Sloan, that's, that's not really the way we run things here. I'm on your board. I tell you, everybody clocks in. 
So I had our receptionist clock the entire company in every morning at eight o'clock and the entire <laughs> company out at five. <laughs> and Sloan sees this one day and he goes, well, your, your staff's very prompt, aren't they? I said, yes, sir. We line up in the morning and we all clock in together and we all clock out at the end of the day. And he knew I was messing with him. And uh, he just looked at me and went, okay, you got me. <laughs> I mean, you. So, I mean, you were very forward thinking. Yeah. I mean, is it then. is it just because of your age as a younger CEO and you? I mean, what was there that that nature of still being like just young and rebellious? No, no, no. It, it was the reverse. When I first took over, I was uh, I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I remember I wanted every decision to be made by me. I'm the CEO. I'm a charge here. You know, I got a big glass wall that overlooks the beach. I'm cool. Uh, and then I found out that everybody was standing in the hallway waiting for me to make decisions. I was the bottleneck. And I eventually figured out that I didn't need to be, I didn't need to make hardly any decisions, all, you know, only big decisions. And they didn't need me for the rest of it. So I, you know, I, I just started saying, come in, you know, come in late, come in early. And then finally I just said, you know, one of the young ladies that worked for me, um, Robin, who's still awesome, uh, she was a national surf champion. And we, were in, we had moved our offices up to Fort Lauderdale. And I said, hey, if surf's up, go. I don't care if you and your husband come in at three o'clock in the morning and do the work. Get a pizza and come in here. Uh, if it's a nice day, go lay on the beach or go surf. And because of that, they, that, that level of responsibility, they did amazing work and they were thankful that I didn't make them come and sit in an office. So it's just because, you know, I wanted to, I, like my CE, CFO, a guy named Jim Williams, he would only give me the financial reports if we were playing golf. <laughs> so every hole, I'll give you another page and I'll discuss it. You know, I'll explain it to you. So I'm gonna we're gonna go have a financial meeting, and they'd be like, "Oh, you're going to play golf, huh?" But you know, is the re here's one of the things I've always loved: be so good they can't ignore you. A lot of people come mm -hmm. to me and say, "You know, I'm, I'm too young. I'm too." I was told I was too young for years and years and years and years. Uh, then all of a sudden, one day I was told I was too old, and I'm like, "What was the one day that I was the right age? <laughs> too young last week, too old this week." But uh, you know, we were having fun, and, and as long as the results were there, nobody messed with us. That's what I always tell people, you know, is if the results are world-class, truly, then why would anybody mess with that? If we did it in a very unconventional way, eh, you know, Mr. Rockefeller and a couple of the other uh, board members were fine with that. There was a few that chafed them, but, you know, when everything, when we're double or tripling every year, and, you know, winning all kinds of awards, and we've got projects going on all over the world with top scientists, the top scientists in the world doing work for us, it's kind of hard to argue with that. Yeah. Where, when did you make the transition in your, in your mind? Like when you, where, when did you realize that you were the bottleneck and things were gonna have to change? Uh, like, was there? Cause I realized stuff wasn't getting done because people were waiting for my approval. And it was literally the- Yeah, but what steps, like what steps do you make in that and realize oh, that, fix, like uh, immediately oh, as a young CEO? Well, I, it, literally the light bulb moment is when I looked up and there was a line of people standing in the hallway to get in for me to make a decision. And I said, I'm, I'm the one causing this. So what I did is, and we'll do a little entrepreneurial thing here, is I brought my whole staff together and I said, from now on, we have four levels of decisions in this company. Level one, you own it. Michael, this is what I hired you for. This is your area of expertise. Don't ask anyone, you make the decision immediately. You own the, the outcome, level one. Level two, Go ask for advice, but go to the right person. I might not be the right person as the CEO. Go talk to the CFO, go talk to our director of marketing, go talk to, you know, director of whatever, but I'm not the right person. That's level two, but then you own the decision. Once you get the advice, you own the decision. Level three is it's a team decision. We're gonna get the appropriate people on the team together, we're gonna to talk it through, and the team will make a decision. And here's the important part I would say, and I will back the team up even if I don't agree. If all of you say, we're gonna go you know, to the right, and I go, oh, I think we gotta go to the left, and the whole team wants to go to the right, we will go to the right, and I will own the outcome as the CEO, because I'll back you. Which got us to level four, which is, it's my decision. I may or may not come to you guys for input, but just like I backed you on a level three, you need to back me on a level four. You need to trust that I have this one for you. And then, you know what I found out, guys? About 60 to 70% of the decisions were level one or level two, and I shouldn't have been involved. So that's when I, I started saying, I don't really need to be involved in everybody's business. I just need to make sure that the work product is beyond my expectations, which are high. Mm -hmm. 
does that go to like, I mean, did you find the people that were there that were making now those level one decisions, were they prepared to do that? Were they equipped to do that? Or did you now have to find the right people that could make those decisions? Uh, no, no, the people were prepared. A few struggled, but you know, they'd come in and I'd, I'd answer, uh, what I started to do is they'd come in and I'd, they'd start to ask me a question. I'd hold up one, you know, that's level one. And they would say, can I, can I ask for some advice? I go, okay, cool, then it becomes a level two. And then a level three and I don't wanna hear it anymore. Or a level two and you own it. So uh, I did for a while, probably about a month and a half, two months, I had to really, we had to make a transition. But after that, pretty much people could handle it on their own or they knew the right person. I was rarely the right person. You know, I, I've been a CEO of five or six different companies. When I left the foundation, I traveled around as a stand-in CEO for a couple of years when CEO quit or got fired or when there was, I love this one, when they were raided by the FBI and put under indictment. I had one of those where I, I got plopped down in one of those, which was really fun. And I learned that CEOs, for the most part, just make big decisions and, and, and uphold the values of the company, the culture. And if I've got a good culture with a great work ethic, with great people, and I make the biggest decisions, best thing I can do is get out of the way. Hire great people and get out of their way. And I, I had a great, great, great team at the foundation. You seem so confident in all of this. <laughs> like, were you during that time, or were you just, were you just a confident individual? Because I, no. I feel, okay. No, I, um, two, two or three things. I like pressure. Okay. Uh, when things get nasty and hard and difficult, that's when I'm, I'm, at, I'm having fun. I won't say necessarily at my best, but that pushes me to be at my best. It's one of the reasons I, I don't, I never wanted to be a professional speaker. Had no desire to, to do what I do. But when I walk in some place now and there, it's set for 15 or 20,000 people and the AV team's freaking out, my client's freaking out, and everybody's getting all worried and I'm the one that's supposed to carry the thing for an hour or three hours with 15,000 people in there, I just go, I got it. Don't worry about it, I got it handled. And the reason is, is I've prepared so much. So I, was, I, was, I tripled down on preparation. So I, my confidence came from you're really not gonna pull something over at me I haven't prepared for. And even if it happens, I'm extremely well prepared and I should be able to fix it, uh, and I enjoy that. But uh, the, here's the thing that, that changed in my life when I became a CEO. I would lay awake at night and think about the 60 kids I had to put through college. Mm. I don't have kids, but every, every person that worked for me, I worried about how am I gonna put their kids through college? How am I gonna make sure they can pay their mortgage? I've got to keep this running really well and I've got to make enough money that I can continue to give people raises, bonuses, take care of them and make sure their kids can go to any college they want them to. So. <laughs> <laughs> Your eyes the, are rolling The pressures, back. the pressures. I mean, like, I mean, it's true though. Like, I, I, I mean, I don't have 50, 60 people or like, you know, but, you, but I, I go through the same things. You go through the same things. We sit here like, talking about this exact same stuff yeah, yeah. like hey how do we you know we want to make sure that our team is is taken care of we have you know such a seasonal cash flow business where yeah. i'm like oh my gosh like, <laughs> well luckily you have the scooter hotel yeah like yeah <laughs> right. like, exactly i mean th thank and for a while we didn't right that, that was one of those things where a parent you know inside the showroom says so you know what does my kid do with this when they go home for the summer and you know, i was like uh they store it with us, of course. <laughs> you know, and it's like, and then we're we, doing that for years. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're number one in Gainesville. We're the only one, but we're that. We were, yeah. One. Nobody else was doing it, and then everybody else started coming. And I think the first, the first summer we did was like a hundred. It was like one hundred fifty bucks, mm -hmm. and then we realized that wow, like that was easy. <laughs> we we didn't charge enough, and I mean, it's funny it's, how that works. Yeah. one hundred fifty. Sure. Oh shit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Should have been two fifty. I didn't realize how much value there was in that and yeah it has become such a very important part of our cash flow and our our season but but it's it's funny because i'm just like yeah i mean i not necessarily thinking about you know our team members and putting their kids through college because most of them are still in college, in college or, just, or just graduated but like very much like making sure that they're taking care of you know what's next i i worry about things probably more on like the medical side sure. if somebody gets yeah. sick or you know yeah. like there's all that but um but yeah, I mean, it's it's just interesting to, to hear that it doesn't change. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I do a lot of uh, executive coaching now, yeah. uh, and I work with several CEOs around the world, and I talked to one the other day. There's an interesting thing that a lot of CEOs or high-level people get, and I have this a little bit in my, myself. It's called the imposter syndrome. 
Have you ever heard of this? Mm -mm. It's when you wake up and you go, when are they going to figure out I have no idea what the hell I'm doing? (laughs) That I'm just making this up as I go along. That I have, I really don't understand what I'm doing. And a lot of CEOs, one of the CEOs I'm coaching, he was a very, very successful CEO of a billion dollar company, youngish, probably in his early 40s. uh, And he he just looked at me and he's like, I I don't know what, what happens when the board finds out I really don't know what I'm doing. I go, they don't know either. Nobody knows, you know. So it, sometimes when I'm doing very high-level strategic planning or something for a multi-billion-dollar company, I'll get to the room at night and go, oh, "I hope that shit works out." <laughs> we, did, we just made that up. I mean, it's, there's a massive amount of preparation, and everything, but at the end of the day, it's just a, it's a well-informed guess. So, you know, like, oh well, gosh. they were making six hundred million-dollar decisions based on that stuff we were going through today. I hope that was right. <laughs> <laughs> Has there ever been a time where it was wrong that you know of? <laughs> no, I mean, there's uh, on any strategy for any company, things shift. But, right. And one of the things I learned too as a, as a consultant and uh, doing strategy work, it's not my job to develop the strategy. It's my job to help them develop the best strategy. I, I, I think it's really being a consultant, an executive coach, and doing strategy work is, is at one point the hardest and the easiest thing I do. It's the hardest because it's a tightrope walk. Uh, I've had a few crash and burn. Um, I've had some where people quit and get up and walk out, literally quit the company, a senior exec, and say, I'm not doing this anymore. Uh, Very rarely has that happened, only once or twice in my career. Uh, So it can blow up, but at the same point, it's not my job to tell them what to do. When I was early in my career, I used to fight people like, I know better than you. Now I'm just like, I don't know, you know, it's my best idea. If you don't like it, that's fine with me. (laughs) You know, whatever you think is good is what we'll do. And I, you know, I'll guide him and give him some advice, but strategy is always built by the company. I'm just the one that's asking the really hard questions to get them, the, the uncomfortable questions they don't want to answer, they don't want to ask each other. I'm the one that asks those questions. I do that with executives too. I ask them questions they would never ask themselves because they're too hard, too challenging, too difficult. And then they develop the answer and I go, the, the key with consulting and these sort of things, and, and listen carefully, is I want to get them to tell me what I wanted them to hear. I want them to try to convince me of exactly what the advice I would have given them. And instead, it's their advice to me. So, and that, that is, it's not manipulation, it's giving them enough information, asking enough questions, and you're thinking in your mind, they really need to do A, B, C. I mean, I, I'm thinking this, and I, I, I'll ask enough questions, and the CEO will look at me and go, I really need to do A, B, C, John. That's what I want to do. You think that's a good idea? I go, you're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> But it's because it, if I tell them I own it, if it blows up, it's John's plan. If it if it goes well, it's their plan. <laughs> so I try not to get blamed for stuff, and I haven't. We we've I've never had one blow up. Yeah. Tell me. So where did some of this transition happen from being the CEO to becoming? You know, you so say you never had plans to become a speaker. No. <laughs> now now that's like all like that's, that's a huge piece of what you 80% do right? of what yeah, I 80% do. Yeah. so I mean now that it's such a huge piece when did that transition happen did you did you end up I mean you obviously love it so. uh, I love helping people the speaking up in front of I'm very introverted really extremely introverted man that fascinates me uh, you'd be surprised how many professional speakers uh, that get up in front of massive crowds are very very highly introverted uh, you'll see some of us back in the quote unquote green room. We're in the corner by ourselves, headphones on, yeah. you know, like just trying to get away from everybody. When I get off stage, it's really hard for me to stick around because I'd rather just run to my room and get away from people. But here's what happened is while I was working for the Rockefellers, I met a gentleman that owned a very large uh, strategic sales training firm that worked with Fortune 100 companies, help them, helping them close deals of $100 million or larger. And he said, if you ever leave the foundation, you call me because I want you to run my company. Dang. And uh, after I had left the foundation, I did a few other things. And then I called him and said, I, I'm interested. And uh, he said, come on over. And he, I introduced him. It was a virtual company. It's, it was all executives from like IBM and, and Deloitte and Touche and McKinsey and company, all these top companies. The people after they retired there became consultants with this company. We did global work. And what happened is I came in at about 35 there. and. And they said, he's going to be the new CEO. And all these guys in their 50s and 60s that have been executives at major companies went, this kid? Hmm. And they said, well, you don't get to be the CEO until you can show us you can do what we do. Hmm. So they put me on the road for about three months. And I traveled all over the world. And for the first month, I sat in the back of the room and I wasn't allowed to say anything. 
just take notes, watch, listen. I would get debriefed, we would debrief afterwards. The next month, they, they let me get up a little bit and do some of the teaching and some of the training and consulting and facilitation. The third month, they shoved me up front and said, you're gonna run the, you're gonna run the whole show, we're gonna watch you, and we're gonna grade you. And at every break, they'd tell me what to do. Well, I flew, I flew back from Tokyo uh, to meet the owner of the company, to take over as CEO, and he said, you don't get to be CEO. And I said, why not? He goes, well, you're one of our lead trainers now. Everybody loves you. And I'm like, I did not put it being the CEO of a multinational company to be a damn sales trainer 28 years later. <laughs> so I did that for about 10 years doing very, very, these were high pressure. You know, I'm working for GE trying to close a $380 million deal. And we were in there putting strategy together, how to do it and all that sort of stuff. And the negotiations, the largest deal I've ever negotiated was $3 billion. Dang. So, uh, and all, you know, that was... Uh, I didn't want to do it. And then I started getting asked. Actually, in my speaking career started by Roger Strickland inviting me back to speak to his class at Santa Fe. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. how everybody started. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. how Kristen is the same way. Yeah. She went back and spoke at uh, Professor Rossi's class. That's, I mean, that's me, I'm like, not on that scale, but like, but like same thing. You know, I go, I spoke at Professor Rossi's class and then I'm like, okay, like I was absolutely terrible the first time and then I've gotten a little bit better, a little bit better. And I'm like, I'm doing four local things next week. And yeah. I'm like, how that happened? This is fun. This is cool. Yeah. Like, I mean, I do. Pe I was people doing seem a lot. to enjoy it. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I, I, it's your I'm, incredibly cute face and cool hats. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> hey, man, whatever, whatever does it. <laughs> like, so that's how it started. Like, I was doing a lot of speaking for the Rockefeller Foundation, and obviously, as a trainer uh, for the company, I was used to being up in front of groups. But uh, Roger said, "Come back and talk to my class at Santa Fe, because I want them to be able to. I want to be able to say literally." This guy sat in your seat 10 years ago, and now he's running a multinational company and flying all over the world. If this bozo can do it, any of you can do it. Because he got here, he was failed out. He had, you know, he was about to get kicked out of college forever. And if he could turn it around, you can turn it around. And uh, that started me, my early quote unquote speaking career, I went to colleges just like Kristen. Actually, I, I believe it was me that introduced Kristen to the agency that picked her up to represent her. And for a couple of years, I flew every week to colleges. I think I talked about 300,000 college students in my career. And then and for I, the, the few people that might not know who we're talking about, we're talking about Kristen Hadid, who's yeah. the founder of Student Made. Yeah. So and that and it took off from there. But still, I, I, uh, I get nervous. I still sweat. I get really nervous when I give talks and uh, I'm confident that's going to turn out OK, but I'm still afraid that I'll do something foolish or stupid and have you had one just completely bomb oh yeah I got booed off the stage my very first speech really uh, working for the Rockefellers my my early CEO the first one there was this really big conference up at uh, MIT at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute the most prestigious marine research institute in the world and he was supposed to go up and give a, an address and welcome everybody because we were we were uh, we were paying for it we were sponsoring the whole event we had people flying in from all over the world and he chickened out or something at the last minute, and he said, you gotta go give the speech. I'm like, huh, I'm, I'm 24, 23. He hands me the speech and says, memorize this, and sends me off. So I get up there, and I'm like 20 something years old. I'm well, in how much of, time did you have? Uh, on the plane. Oh, like on the plane. Yeah, he's like, okay. I don't go, you take my ticket, you go. So I only had like on the plane in the night before to even read this thing. And uh, I get up there in front of all the most eminent scientists in the world, and I mispronounce everyone's name. Oh my God! I'm like, Dr. Flubbenflabbern from Germany, <laughs> and Dr. Schmucklock from, you know, Poland, and about halfway through, the mic went out, and I'm like, pum, 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 mic's broken. They went, mic's not broken, you're done. And they walked me off the stage. Oh my God! Here's what happened though. Those folks took me to dinner that night and said, whoever made you do this, you go home and kick them in the ass, because they set you up for failure. You never should have been up there. They were so sweet to me. They just like, we all felt bad for you, not because you didn't know what you were screwing up the speech, because it was obvious this wasn't your speech, you didn't write it, and you weren't the one that was supposed to give it. And we, we give you a lot of credit for having courage and standing up there and just bombing. So I've also walked off the front of the stage a couple of times and fallen in the orchestra pit. So, I mean, is that like, <laughs> like them, them coming to you and, and, and saying that you should never have been on there, like, like is, is that what allowed you to get back on stage? Because I got to think, 
for a lot of people, something like that happening to them is like, yeah, hard I'm to, done. Hard to get back on I'm the horse never after getting that. back on stage yeah. again. No, no, no. It, that, it was them doing that that helped me. Um, and I, I'd given, a, you know, I knew I could do it. It's just I was put in a horrible position. But I, I had the worst speech ever in my life last year. Really? Yeah, I had. <laughs> that seems so no, crazy to me. They, no, you're, you're going to love this story. So I'm, I'm going to a thing called the Million Dollar Roundtable, which is the top. Uh, it's where I had given the biggest speech I'd ever given, 26,000 people in uh, like 19 different languages, more languages than the United Nations. And I'd been the keynote speaker on the main stage like two years earlier. And they asked me, hey, can you come back and do a couple workshops on leadership? And uh, it'll be all you know English speakers, 100 people, we want it very inactive, people moving around, talking, doing workshops, eh, got it, no problem, that's what I do every week, that's easy. I get there and they go, oh, um, one of our other instructors didn't show up, can you do one uh, for Mandarin Chinese, but we have two interpreters, so don't worry about it. I'm like, I, I can do, yeah, I can do interpreters, it's no problem. So I go into the, the thing to do the Chinese thing, it's set for 5,000. 5,000 <laughs> Chinese Mandarin speakers. And I'm like, oh shit, I'm dead. And I went to my handler and I said, I can't do a workshop in this. I, I, got, I got 90 minutes and I, I can't do a workshop with 5,000 people. He said, no, no, we want that. I, I said, it just doesn't work with 5,000 people. No, that's what we want. Okay. Uh, the speech was awesome. I went real slow, they translated it. And the way they translated it is they, they put it on earphones on your iPad, I mean on your phone, and you just dial into the correct number and everybody gets it in their own language. So they're translating, it's going great. They're taking pictures, they're writing notes like furious, it's awesome. And then they go, and now for a workshop. 3,000 got up and walked out right there. I mean, just boom, it would look like they had hit the fire alarm. Lines for the doors. I had 3,000 people get up and walk out on me. Then about 10 minutes later, another thousand got up and walked out. By the time it was done, I had about 300 people left in the room. Great workshop with 300. Yeah. But I've had 4,700 people <laughs> walk out of one of my speeches. Oh my God. <laughs> and I figured if, if I live through that, I can live through anything. <laughs> yeah. It's probably good that it's come after all these years of experience and you're oh, not as like bothered by it. <laughs> I went, uh, went back to my hotel, which had the, hot, the highest bar in the Western Hemisphere, kicked my feet up on the wall, had a beer and said, well, I lived through that. It can't. And as I was going there, they were waiting outside to get pictures with me. I mean, a whole bus of folks unloaded and I had to take a picture with every one of them. And I thought, well, they like me, but they just don't like workshops. And that's what it turned out. They just, they don't like workshops. Yeah. The giant, that particular um, nationality, those sort of folks, just, they don't do workshops. So as soon as I announced it, 4,000 of them are gone. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're out of here, see ya. Now I'll tell you, standing at the stage watching that is really challenging yeah. to see you know, a full room down to a handful of people sitting in the front. But you knew that the speech went well, or like, oh, yeah. or did you? Were you just like, uh oh, maybe it didn't go as well as I thought it did? <laughs> uh, it, I got nervous there, but it, it wasn't for me. It was for my handlers, the people, because I, you know, they were paying me a lot of money to be there, and I thought they'd be really mad at me. They came up and apologized afterwards too, just like the first one. They said we shouldn't have done that to you. Yeah. We should have understood that we didn't even know it, and we apologize. So, who's the who's the coolest person that you've gotten to share the stage with, and you like? that you admire? Uh, oh, that I admire? Or like, or I mean, anybody you would be like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm sharing the stage with this person? I've done Shaquille O'Neal, Walt, uh, wait a minute, pa Peyton? No, not, um, who's the quarterback that won the Super Bowl Cup years? Was it Peyton? Peyton Manning? Peyton Manning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Me, Shaquille O'Neal, Peyton Manning. Um, the guy, my favorite is the guy who shot Osama Bin Laden. Uh, really cool guy. The wow. Navy SEAL who shot him. Um, I've been with Gary Vaynerchuk and a bunch of the other ones. He's fun, uh, most profane speaker in the world. <laughs> a lot of yeah. energy there. Uh, <laughs> he's like a cage. A he's like a cage tiger. He rolls his sleeves up and he prowls back and forth the stage. He's all. I mean, he's almost in the audience. He gets so far over. He's you a know, lot of fun. What's, so it's interesting because I'm hearing you talking about like you know you do a lot of this like preparation. You're going. Yeah. You're like ready. Like he. The I've watched and followed Gary Vaynerchuk for years. Um, he, it's funny if you watch his vlog, he will go up to whoever the person is who is putting on the conference like five minutes before the conference and go, "Who's in the audience?" Yeah, yeah. And then he just steps on stage and like delivers. Like yeah. he just has like these go to whether it's philosophies, leader, like the things that he does. But he just reads the audience yeah. and just well, he's got he's got a lot it, of information. 
he wings it with years and years and of years experience. of experience and preparation. Right. No, for sure. But no, he showed up at ours 10 minutes before in a full entourage and everything. Really nice guy. I, I work with a lot of speakers that are not nice people backstage. Mm. He was a great guy. And uh, he wa- oh, Simon Sinek was there too on that one. Okay. And he cool. walked on and just, Gary just nailed it. Yeah. Just na- uh, we were there. It's in New York City for sales. It's all sales people. It's for Salesforce. So he fit in real well. <laughs> <laughs> it's in his element. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. He was in his element. Yeah. I had a 10 minute conversation with him the other day. And it was simply because I bought his wine. Like, oh I, like I bought like his wine subscription and he was like on Instagram and I was like, yeah, if you buy this, I'm going to call you. And sure enough, he called me. I'm like, dude, this is crazy. Like, But anyway. Yeah, no, he's really down to earth. He's a really yeah, fun guy. Yeah, he's super cool. Yeah. And, you know, even though he comes off as really aggressive, he's actually a very sweet person. He's a very caring person. That's awesome. I have uh, a couple of questions from... Gainesville business owners. Okay. You're <laughs> gonna tell me that I don't want to You're gonna say um, this is no, from. It was from, it was from a, a mix. Of, oh, don't worry of about it. Yeah, um, and it's funny because I think people want to know the things that you've really screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of those. There's so, tons of them. What's the like? What's the biggest thing that you've messed up in the last seven years? Seven years. Uh, biggest thing I've messed up in the last seven years. Let's go back a little bit further. Okay. Um, Hiring the wrong people. I've made a couple mishires, and it's been extremely challenging to the business uh, and to my, because I I consider employees friends. Uh, It's a family, and you can get really tight with folks, and when you get really, really tight with folks, and then you realize they can't do the work, uh, or they've got a different set of values than you thought they had, Mm. and uh, it's just hard to let them go. So those are, you know, hiring the wrong people, are you a like a higher slow fire fast? Kind Absolutely. Of okay, because there's yeah. a lot of people. That's one of those philosophies that I'm always fascinated by. Because actually, kind of going back to Gary, Gary is very much a higher fast fire fast. He's like, yeah. you know, there's there's multiple CEOs that I've talked to that are like, no, there's definitely times where in business you're like growing so fast that you have to be like, oh, you, you have a pulse, get in here, yeah. <laughs> you know. And well, the truth is, if you if you understand that talent drives your company, you should constantly be looking for talent. You should be mining it. You should have. Uh, one of the companies I started, uh, I started because there was a guy that I had chased for like five years and said, when you quit the job where you are, I will build a company with you because I think you're so talented. Wow. And That's I've awesome. always got people, you know, in the wings, I've got a couple of people I work with now that if I can't do something, I turn it over to them. And I've had, I've been one guy 11 years. We've been, I've been, I got one guy I worked with for 17 years, one guy with 11 years, but, the, but with both of them, it was four or five years before I trusted them enough to hand stuff off. I get, now I get people all the time who go, oh, you need to work with this guy or that gal. And I say, here's my bar. If I wouldn't work for them, I won't work with them. And most of them go, never mind. <laughs> Don't worry about that. That's not the way it's gonna work. But I think trusting people in partnerships and in business and in employees has been the biggest mistake I've made. Interesting. Um, that's the biggest mistake. That's that was the other question. Was what's the biggest thing you've ever screwed up? With? I think it's that Chinese uh, speech. <laughs> 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 and and I, I really really like this question because I mean it's really related to to Gainesville and it's it's you know you've traveled the world you've seen tons of communities yeah, right yeah. like what do you think Gainesville needs to meet its potential like what where are we lacking? Uh, we're, we're lacking in attracting enough funding to have a more robust uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. We've got really, really talented people here. We've got one of the best universities. Do you think you can fix that for us? Uh, <laughs> you know, put, put, in all seriousness. You like pressure. Let's put some pressure yeah, yeah. on your shoulders. No, we tried. I, I was heavily, heavily involved when we had, uh, what was it called? When they started the very first entrepreneurial thing at the chamber. Uh, I was on the board and we, we try to bring people in here. You know what? It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. People go, well, I don't want to put an office there or anything because I can't get a direct flight. Like, it's a, it's a shot through Atlanta. I fly all over the world out of Gainesville. Hmm. I only fly out of Gainesville. I won't go out of, inter, out of any other airports because I want to support our community. It's a big deal. You, you got an hour turnover in Atlanta, now Dallas or, or Charlotte. Yeah. yeah, they just added Dallas, yeah, so now it's, yeah. and I'm that's start, a huge hub. I can't, yeah, I, I do, I have a couple of clients in uh, Dallas and uh, San Antonio now. It's awesome for me. Uh, but that's the excuse I hear from people of, oh, we don't want to get there because it's too hard to get there. That is just, I can't understand it. We have great talent, we have an amazing university, we're spinning off a lot of companies, 
Uh, but we're sending people, there, there's a, used to be a brain drain of people that thought they had to go to Silicon Valley or Boston or something. Mm -hmm. Now they're starting to come back. And I think, but that's the number one is attracting bigger companies like a Microsoft or a, you know, ADM or IBM or one of the three letter ones or Google to, to put an office here that we could, we could bring capital and get, get on the map a little bit more. I think that's the only thing holding us back. We have all the other tools. Yeah, and it's an awesome place to live. You, you know, you've got an incredible sports community. We've got arts. We've got access to incredibly smart people that fly in to give speeches and talks. Yeah. Yeah, it's a gorgeous place to live. It, I mean, I could live anywhere in the world, literally anywhere in the world. I love it here. Yeah. Well, and I think I've told people multiple times is that I think Gainesville often gets labeled as a college town, which is natural because, I mean, we have the University of Florida here, but it's so much more than that. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> and it's just it's it's fascinating to see the growth over even the time that I've been here. I mean, it still blows my mind that I've been in Gainesville for 19 years and it's just since 2000. The, oh, it's been incredible. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. Incredible. And the entrepreneurial community is just is just the best, like yeah. the best. And just the the ability to to reach out to people like yours. I mean, like the fact that you know, the first time I sent him an email, I'm like, oh my gosh, he responded. This is like crazy. Like this actually happens. Are you serious? Yeah, you know? I respond to all all the emails. Yeah. So I and I get them from folks all over the world. It's fun. It's nice. I mean, that's what I've I've dedicated my life to helping businesses and people be more successful. That's my mission in life. So I, I like to be of service. It's fun. I like to help. What's the where's the coolest place that you've traveled to? New Zealand. New Zealand. It took me a little while to answer that, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, New Zealand by far. I mean, I've been to some really cool places, but uh, I've well, got family in New Zealand now. I've got a godson there, okay, and uh, business partners there. Well, aren't you? Weren't you like doing a study or something with the All Blacks? And yeah, no, I, I um, got to spend some time with the captain of the All Blacks. Okay, which I actually have a, Jewish, a rugby, the rugby team, there. rugby, rugby, yeah, the listening. New Zealand national team. And uh, I got to go. Can you do like a what do they call haka, it? The haka? haka. Yeah, I cannot do the haka. And I don't. <laughs> I have think a you should stand up and do a haka. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. Although my yeah. business partners over there are both uh, special forces, uh, and they're both one still in the military, one's out, and they become part of a Maori tribe when they join the military there because the military is considered a tribe. So they do the haka and they've got war, uh, war bands and stuff. And those things over there have to, the tattoo artist has to get to know you mm. for years before they feel like they know you well enough and understand you and your family and they will actually do that tattoo on you. And there's very oh, few that are, um, yeah. that are allowed to actually do a real Maori tattoo. It's a tremendous honor, and it's it, you know just because you see people with the Tahitian war bands. I love the guys with the Jap or gals with Japanese thing. That's the wrong word. Mm. That always makes me happy. <laughs> uh, so, or you see so. a guy with a big chin uh, tattoo. Only women get those in New Zealand. <laughs> Only women can wear those oh. in Maori. <laughs> wow. So, um, I love New Zealand. I love to fly fish. So, it's one of the top three or four places in the world to fly fish, and. Uh, we we've, we've we purposely went out and tried to get business there, and now we go every year for a couple of weeks. Is fly fishing one of those things that kind of like is a mental release? Yes. for you. Like, yeah. do you get like your best ideas and stuff when you're out there doing? No, that? you can't. No? I can't. You can't think at all. You you're walking in a slippery stream, trying to cast, which is very challenging, to a very small target a long ways away. Usually, and you know, usually you're way back in the woods. I can't. You know, think a lot. I'm just trying not to fall down and kill myself. Okay, uh, and it's kind of like golf. Uh, you've got to be in the zone. Okay. So it's one of the reasons I love it. It's the only place I can turn my mind off. Yeah, the reason I asked it, like even yesterday I was talking to Allison, who's the CEO of our new agency, and uh, I was like, you know, I, I hate running. Like, I absolutely hate to go out and run, but like my best ideas come when I'm running. <laughs> And I don't know if it's just, uh, like a mental relief. That's why I was asking that question, because I was wondering if it was one of those moments like where you're just, mind is just boom and then ideas come flowing in it's for me when i'm driving in the car okay mm -hmm. um now i listen to books in the car a lot but i'll just shut them off and like i had to drive to orlando the other day i donated a speech to a, a high school group down there and uh, i had two and a half hours down two and a half hours back i turn off the radio and think the whole way mm. and what i do then is i now with i just go i uh, hit the thing and i send myself a text yeah so if i come up with a good idea I just hit the button and go send me a text and i send myself <laughs> an idea or something to look at or that's what i do when i'm listening to books if a good idea comes i stop it and then send myself a text or an email with the idea that i came up with 
That's awesome. That's this has cool. been a lot of fun, man. Mm. I'm so grateful that you've come in. Oh, it's my, it's my pleasure. <laughs> hey, do you have any last questions before we wrap this baby I, up? None that really make a good segue or anything. They, they, well, they've all, they're all there's, there's so much. Like, like I said, it's a six-hour podcast. Let's go. <laughs> right. I mean, it really could be. Uh, from a leadership standpoint, like... Uh, I almost want to ask, did you take your own advice with some of the stuff you said? Because we were, for one, talking with uh, Gainer, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk about you know hiring slow, firing fast, right? One of the things I remember from from your speech back at Freshbark um, in 2013 was actually talking about um, dealing with underperforming employees, and, and we live in an internet internet age now where I can literally just Google your steps or whatever. Yeah. But, like, but I remember it was something about um, you know asking him first. Uh, do they have the tools necessary to feel like they're doing their job? And the second was like maybe reallocating them to somewhere else. Yeah. Um, oh, that was the uh, the three T's, train, transfer, terminate. Right. Can, can I train them up to do well? Uh, if not, can I move them someplace in the company where they will add value? And if I can't train them, I can't transfer them, uh, then it's time to, as we say, make them available to industry. And do you feel like those things are still true? I mean, do, oh, you would still recommend people follow that? Yeah, I, I have a, um, and do we have a minute or two, Colin? Yeah, 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 no, we can go for six hours, like I said. <laughs> okay, well, I, I've got a new system that I use, uh, and it's called the four pieces of paper. And here's what that is. When someone is, is not, not performing at the level they know, and they know it, they, we've told them and they're coached and we've tried and they're just not making it, and it's one step before it's time to do the three T's or just terminate them, I ask them to come in my office, or when I used to run big companies, and I'd say, come to my office and bring four pieces of paper. Piece of paper number one, what are you gonna do in the next 60 or 90 days, depending on the speed of your company, let's just say 90 days, uh, that's gonna show me and everybody else here that you should stay? What specifically are you gonna change, do differently, what will you deliver? And I want you to write that out. So I have them write out, what will they do to prove to everyone that they should stay in the company? We talk about it, we discuss it, negotiate a little bit, then we both sign it. It's not a legal contract, it's a, it's a promise between two professionals. Piece of paper one, slide that over. Piece of paper number two, what do you need from me to make that happen? What resources, training, help, assistance, you know, what's everything I have to do for you to make sure that you can achieve everything on piece of paper one? And again, we negotiate that, make sure it's fair and reasonable, then we both sign it. Piece of paper number three, if you achieve everything you promised on piece of paper number one, in addition to keeping your job, which is pretty cool, uh, <laughs> what, what would you like as some sort of a small reward? You know, and uh, you know, dinner out with your family, whatever, because you will have done something amazing. You will have gone from the verge of being terminated to back on the team. You've done a 180. And then we'll tear this stuff up and forget about it. That's piece of paper number three. Again, we agreed on it, assign it. And then piece of paper number four is if you don't deliver everything on piece of paper number one, what should the ramifications be? What do they always put? Termination, Termination. or I'll quit. So you go, great, we sign them all, and then say, all right, every Monday, come in, and we're gonna go over this list and see how we're doing. Every Monday they come in, you say, how are you doing on piece of paper number one? Great, is there anything else you need from me on piece of paper number two? And every time I deliver some piece of my paper number two, we sign it, okay, I gave you that, gave you that, gave you that. Uh, you're doing great, Colin, I think you're awesome, man. It looks like you're gonna get to piece of paper number three. Uh, Michael, not so much. <laughs> and what happens is, usually if it's a 90 days, about 65, 70 days in, Either they've done almost all of it and you go, congratulations, you ball it up, throw it in the garbage can and say your performance is where it needs to be now. Keep that up. Have a great dinner at Dragonfly or whatever with your family. Wow, you're awesome. More than, light, more than often, they come in and they look at it and they've only done 10%. Mm -hmm. and, they, and here's why I do it with them writing it, because they can't say, this wasn't fair. You, you set the goals too high. No, you set them. You know, I didn't understand what I was supposed to do. No, you wrote it. You didn't give me everything you said you'd give me. No, we signed off on everything. I actually gave you five additional things here. Uh, you know, so there's no like, you were, no, it was you. You ran this all, you had the control of it. I gave you everything you asked for, you did not deliver. Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, they self-terminate. I mean, I, I've owned a lot of companies and run a couple of big companies. I very rarely have had to fire anybody. They normally self-terminate. Uh, or the one or two that do, then you put them on performance plan. You know, PIP was what they call a performance improvement plan. And that's basically legally covering your butt so you can terminate them without getting fired. I mean, without getting sued. Mm -hmm. But those four pieces of paper, a lot of people say it's the most important thing they take away from some of my seminars. Yeah, it's and, awesome. Oh, and they call me back and go, four pieces of paper. And I'm like, don't go to your office and go, what, four for you, four for you, four for you. <laughs> <laughs> Start hitting. Everybody, Everybody gets paper. Everybody gets 
four pieces of paper. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, that's Man, fun. I could literally, I could go all day. I, and you guys, I'm just gonna leave, leave it with this. John speaks often in the Gainesville community. Go see him. Any opportunity that you get, go see him. Um, and in the meantime, connect with this guy online. What can they find you? John Spence. Uh, John Spence. Com. And then go sign up for the blog and the newsletter. Yeah. I mean, if you, I only put stuff in there that I'm in, that I think is really helpful. You know, if that newsletter, it's the art. Like you said, you follow me on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Uh, I only put stuff on there. The stuff that I send to my clients go, hey, this is really cool. You need to read it. That's the same thing with the newsletter. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool, man. Thank you so much. My Pre- pleasure. Appreciate my it. It's so awesome. Thank you, man. Yeah. Oh, no, I no. It. I had fun, too. <laughs> All right, Gates. Well, there it is. John Spence, go check him out. This is the WHOA GMV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. whoa. <laughs> John, give me a whoa. I did. There was oh, a low. you did? There was a low. Uh, try it again. <laughs> whoa. I was going for that. I was going for the radio. Oh, I just wanted to get him I there. I wanted to hear that. Whoa. I was going for that. Whoa. <laughs> Sultry. <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.